So, so we were looking for something that was going to be a little different for you. Um, you know, we talk about sequence of operations and software and all this kind of thing. We wanted something that would really capture your interest. And we were delighted to find this talk about air handle, well, uh, building operations in general at a very unusual facility that some of you may have visited, the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so it's one thing to operate a building that's just kind of normally got people in it and you can call up somebody and say, I don't know how to do this and somebody's likely to be in a building similar. But this building in particular has some pretty unusual inhabitants. So I will hand it over right now to Ari Hardy. Um, Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, all right. All right, so my name is Ari. Uh, I was the director of building systems of the California Academy of Sciences from the uh, from prior to its opening, which is the, the new one right here. Uh, the old one suffered um, pretty much pretty close to catastrophic failure, damage from earthquakes, and then degradation of the foundation due to um, salt water infiltration from the system that they had. Uh, the old system that they had was actually they pumped water from the beach. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. That's better. Better. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the old system had uh, had pumped water up from the beach and uh, from an infiltration system out at the ocean beach, and then was a basically continuous loss system of about 60 gallons per minute that went into the San Francisco sewer. Um, that obviously messes up the sewer system and all that. So uh, the new, anyways, the, it was torn down in about 2004. They moved out and started the, the process. It was a big hole. And then uh, 2008, the new California Academy of Sciences was opened. Um, I did get to work on the project as one of the engineers on it prior to working there myself. I was an engineer with uh, the control system for the PSI control system, and I, I wrote the, uh, I did the instrumentation design for the aquarium, and then also wrote the logic for the aquarium, and then did the art as contractor, um, which was probably the coolest job I've, I've done so far. Um, uh, unfortunately, they don't build aquariums over time. Uh, anyway, so the Stunhart Aquarium um, is just a component of the California Academy of Sciences, and it's what I'm going to talk about first. Uh, it's it's a pretty big place. Can I just get a quick show of hands? How many people have actually been been there? You. Um, so it, it's a good place. Um, it's a nice place to visit. It's in Golden Gate Park. There's other museums there. If you do get a chance on your visit here or in a future visit, it's. You know, it's probably the best cultural institution in the in the city right now. Um, you know, arguably families, etc. Uh, so this is just a shot of the tunnel going through the rainforest. So you can see the fish across. This is Arapaima, um, which is a South American giant fish that actually will jump out of the water and eat birds, um, and, and has done that in the aquarium. There, they actually put nets up. Um, occasionally, the uh, and then this is the um, the small tanks at the aquarium, and this is these are these sort of four metal glass panels with a lot of lighting. Uh, I was in there, of course, before these were there, and it was pretty cool, open also. But they're pretty nice. um, this is the rainforest dome itself. That's uh, it's it's three levels here with an elevator down the center. And then um, there's the fine return ducts behind the elevator, or to the side of the elevator shaft, sort of at the back on this side here. There's a lot of, of HID lighting in the top there. Um, some, a lot of it on the outside. Some of it uh, was being moved on the inside when I was there. It was part of one of the things my team was doing. Um, so there's tremendous amount of heat load in the, in the top space there, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, the academy um, went through two lead processes. Um, we have two uh, lead platinum certifications. And so this is some work I did uh, for the second one, which is lead for operations and maintenance. 
And uh, so just to give you a sense of, of what the floor space looks like, so there's a lot of it public floor, but by no means you know, the vast majority, um, or not more than half, um, there's a significant collection space, which is broken up between sort of collections of specimens stored in alcohol, um, fishes and invertebrates and things like that, and then other collections of like uh, anthropological collections and um, bones and what have you. He started office space, music the, uh, the building systems themselves, and I think what we're going to get into a little more detail here, are, are broken up pretty much like this. This is a pretty accurate architectural diagram of the building systems and, uh, and somewhat how it's integrated. So we have a, a pretty much standalone aquarium life support system that's on an Alan Bradley uh, control logics controller with a bunch of distributed AI, or sorry, IO. And then uh, there's and then some other uh, historians and other servers. And then the uh, building automation system is a Siemens Apogee system, and that's really quite complex. Uh, that's this part here. So a lot of little Macs. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Probably are, right? Um, and, and then some other types of controllers, control line, cooling towers, chillers, things like that. And then a distributed automation system, or a distributed um, operator interface. And uh, there's also a, a, an integrated irrigation control system um, that has some level of integration with the building automation. I'll talk about that a little bit. Later. And then also a Siemens uh, lighting system. This was before the graphic. Um, this was sorry, this was before the Quantum I version. So their graphic processors. And uh, there's an Ethernet integration with the building automation system for controls of shape. How am I doing on the microphone here? Everybody here, okay? All right, I, I, I tend to drift in these things. Anyways, I think that gives you good topology. Uh, also, I was managing the security system. I didn't diagram it here. I, I don't usually share details of security systems with groups because I think that's not uh, prudent. Um, anyways, there's a, there's a software house system. The, the integration by system looks sort of something like this if you want to think about it in terms of Venn diagrams, right? So we have some systems that are a little bit integrated, right? Maybe with some direct, uh, some direct um, wiring, maybe some dry contact, something like this, which is sort of represented here. Some more significant integration having to do with with the uh, backnet gateways, things like that, more complex. And then um, also the lighting system is integrated with the DMX system, which is the, what's used for uh, show control. That's sort of ex exhibit lighting, um, <coughs> presentation lighting systems. Everybody pretty familiar at this point with, with all these different systems, General? Yeah. What about that security system? All right, so the security system, <laughs> we won't talk about it anymore. The next slide. Yeah, so I, actually, one of the things that we did do, which was kind of fun, is that we integrated the security system with the timekeeping system. So as soon as you're fired, your badge doesn't work anywhere in the whole building. Um, and, to, uh, and to straighten out timekeeping in terms of time cards when you log in, as you log in with the badge, it's just kind of a, kind of a fun thing to make it easier. Fire life safety is standalone in California. It's not allowed to be integrated. Um, so the, the fire life safety was an Edwards system. Uh, it was managed by external contractor, um, as many are. But that's pretty specific to California. I know like in other states, like in Nevada, you can have it integrated with building automation, and typically are. Um, but in California, you can't do that. You can't even have a, uh, a serial output to the building automation system for logging. So the, the logging was basically a print school. Uh, hopefully they'll, they'll update that at some point, but California, I think, has a lot of momentum. Uh, more questions on this topic? We, uh, so uh, I think the first real challenge that I got, got dumped with when I went to work there uh, which was in uh, April 2008. Um, well, actually, I, I had a couple of challenges. The, the first challenge was that uh, my wife was due to have a baby in a month, 
um, and I was starting a new job and opening a new aquarium. So that was challenging by itself. Um, but uh, the first thing they said was, okay, we've got the rainforest, uh, the humidification system was too expensive and it was valued at near oh. Uh, right. so, yeah, fix it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can see actually here. There's a, there's this rope here across, and then uh, I don't know if that's a good example. Anyways, I just thought I'd show this. You can see um, this is early on picture. It's um, the plants are pretty lightly grown. Everything had to be kind of installed. I mean, this thing looked, looked like a wreck up until maybe a week before the place was open. They were still doing exhibits, putting different, you know, putting concrete in, um, shock crate, everything else. Uh, so the first thing that I did here is I put in this um, this mist waterfall system, which is falling off here. So these are sort of yard arms which are each about six feet long, which kind of gives you a sense of the scale here. Um, and this is a three-story elevator here. Um, so there's two of these. They're controlled off of uh, the humidity in the space, and then they create a misting waterfall which falls down the front of the elevator enclosure. It's actually open. This is just a scrim. The, the elevator shaft is actually just a, a, C, a C shape rather than a than an actual full enclosure. Full enclosure. It's not, it's actually completely separate. Uh, this is a high pressure system. Um, so it's high pressure vaporization um, with ruby nozzles. And uh, this was fed by deionized water um, just to, to keep the corrosion down on the nozzles. And then actually when we were running it, the, we found that we had a little issue with dilution of the, uh, of the freshwater system here just from the amount of water we had to dump in in order to keep humidity up. What was that humidity level in your, your target? 85, yes. Same, same? What was your relative humidity target? Uh, it, it was about 75%, and and it, it's basically 75%, 75 degrees to 80 degrees. I mean, there's it's, it's a tall space, so there's a lot of temperature stratification. So at the top, it's more like 80, 85. Um, can even be hotter on sunny days. There's a lot of lighting up there. Down at the bottom, it's it's more like 75, 75. So a little more comfortable. At the bottom, as you wind your way up the ramps, um, it gets up much more comfortable. Um, but the plants like it. Uh, that also, um, the, so we got this, uh, got the uh, systems going here for recirculation, and then immediately covered all of the return air vents with bug mesh uh, to comply with the Department of Agriculture requirements because of the insects that they had in here. They had uh, leaf cutter ants and all kinds of other fun things, um, butterflies and uh, orb leaf spiders and things like that, which do get out, by the way. They're huge. Uh, so we covered this whole thing up with these, uh, with bug mesh and which yeah, so exactly. Pressure drop. Actually, the, the first place that they put the, uh, the bug mesh was not at the top of the duct where there was room. They actually put it in the duct down near the <laughs> room. And the, so after we put butterflies in the first time, we started seeing this, you know, pressure going up and the flow's going down and we're just not making a set point. And so I, and I went down to go troubleshoot the system and I found this stuff in maybe, you know, three foot by three foot duct that uh, completely plastered with butterflies. Um, this completely, and air doesn't go through butterflies. <laughs> so uh, so we had the, the station engineers cut that out, and then we had screens made to cover the entire top of the return air where we had enough surface area to be able to keep up with the, the mess made by butterflies and, and birds and things. Did that affect your net free zone, your net free opening? Uh, yeah, it, it did, but we um, there was enough free area there. Um, basically, the, the return air louvers were on the side in a vertical configuration, and there was enough open area across the whole top of it that we, we were able to have enough free air. And, and I did do the calculation for it. 
Um, did that bug mesh is probably pretty restrictive. What's that? So how, how restrictive was that bug mesh? Uh, it's about what you see here. It, it's tiny. That's a that's a that's a ladybug. That's a ladybug right there. Yeah, it, it's screen. It, I mean, it, it's it's meant to keep ants out. Uh, yeah. So uh, the the next thing that we started uh, dealing with a little bit later on was this sort of intermittent problem with the elevator, which was that the elevators would, would break. And, and this is after we fixed the first problem, which was that the components of the elevator were built, not built to a rainforest standard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, it's, a funny, it, it's a funny conversation. They, they're called the rainforest elevators. But anyways, uh, so, so that got fixed. And then uh, we started running them, and then there's this problem with the, the doors on the bottom floor. So this goes down into the basement here. And the, the doors would kept, kept breaking, not functioning. And so it turned out that in certain ventilation conditions, the, um, the dome would overpressurize, and there was an air, there's a airlock going into this space. And I, can, I think I can go back here real quick. There's an airlock kind of around the corner here to get in. There's there's no airlock there's no airlock to get out. And so the elevator was the airlock. So and the elevator doors were the, the final door of, of the airlock, right? So pressure differential across the doors of you know a half inch of uh, uh, water causes them to not function. Right? Uh, so one of the projects that we did to rectify that was actually putting in a, an airlock at the bottom at the exit also and then we did. Then I we implemented uh, active pressurization control of the dome itself. So we were controlling fans and, and to minimize the, the maximum pressure. Um, questions here? You no. Keep it slightly positive, or what kind of pressure are you going for? It, you know, just because of, of how it was built, it ended up being, it ended up being slightly positive. Um, it, it's also good to keep animal habitat slightly positive. Any well, it. I, I got, let me say, you design it differently depending on what it is. This was actually engineered to be negative. It's, it's never, it was never negative, just to, in order to get the airflows what they needed to be for ventilation, um, it ended up having to go positive. Uh, the, so this one was positive. The penguin enclosure is negative. Um, and that's mainly to keep out the smell out of the, the guest area. Do you have any a lot of saturation points? Um, or any here. Not too uh, bad. Not this, too good. this is in the building, right? Yes, so it's in the building. Mm -hmm. No, no condensation problems on the walls. Uh, in the morning, it would it would get some condensation uh, once it once it got up, but it's pretty well controlled. I remember, early on, all we had was this waterfall system. Um, later on, we uh, did another project. Where we, in, where we introduced the dry steam humidifier <coughs> into the air handling system, um, and so we humidify the air directly. What, where are the supply diffusers? The supply diffusers are in the ring around here. Um, you can probably see one right here. There's, they're <coughs> sort of those eyeball. Yeah, so they, they wash up the glass. Um, they're just little eyeballs. With the, re with the ventilation requirement for how many people are in there breathing, um, and we have, we were running this with demand controlled ventilation, right? So, uh, so on a quiet day, we reach we reach temperature and humidity easily. Quiet day meaning not a lot of visitors. It, you maintain temperature and humidity, and the drive steam barely has to run, right? On a busy day. You have to bring in so much air to keep up with the CO2 breathing out by the by the visitors coming through here that you um, you end up having to add a lot more CO2. You don't you have a harder time keeping up with set points, and then and the condensation of course goes away because there's no available space in the air. So are you using the demand ventilation? This is demand control ventilation. Yeah, well, pretty much all the air handling units in the academy were demand controlled ventilation. Do so the plants contribute excess oxygen? Not enough to make any big difference. 
As far as I can tell, I mean, so so this is the the uh, early one. This is uh, later on picture. I think this is 2017, and it's it's really quite grown in. Now it's a lot harder to see. There's a lot more birds. The misting system. I think they still use it occasionally, but it's not the primary humidity control. Um, let me keep moving along here. Or I think we're going to run out of time. But uh, somebody maybe can can give me a holler if we get the long. Um, this is the, the traditional uh, diver Santa, the coral reef diver Santa. And uh, so aquarium life support system, of course this system is the one that, that I worked on um, as an engineer. And uh, it's, it's basically set up around as a circulation, recirculation and filtration system. And um, it was, uh, this is the original human machine interface, so operator interface. That up. I, I didn't, uh, somebody else did that, and I actually didn't quite like it. It was kind of in my chart. Um, and so I, I rewrote that when I was there um, to be, this was the, the final version. And this is just one screen. This is the coral reef screen. Um, there's probably, I don't know, 20 screens or something like that for all the different components. Um, and this is just a little picture of the Alan Bradley um, IO. It's flex IO. Anybody here work with Alan Bradley and stuff? Yeah. Anybody a little bit? Sand, yeah, exactly. Sand filters, um, some some carbon filtration for water systems. Here's just, just one of the water systems. So there's basically three water systems. There's hot salt water, cold salt water, and then fresh water that get distributed to to all the aquarium systems. So the, and those are stored in cisterns in the building. Um, then we're monitoring uh, salinity and um, ORP, and then also uh, injecting ozone and doing some other things. Temperature control, of course. Uh, so uh, any other quickie questions about life support? We can, yes? You just, you're watching all your filters, differential, that kind of stuff, I mean, just... Yeah, you know the the filtration system. Actually, this is this is a funny picture because this is the only one that wasn't built this way. The filtration systems were built with automated valving and and automated filter loading um, sensing by flow rate. Um, and, and I know because I, I wrote it and commissioned it. And so all of the other systems were able to detect when they were loaded and then um, either automatically or manually initiate an automatic valve flush. Um, at the coral reef was actually just specified to not have this automated uh, valve control for the systems um, because they wanted that to be done by hand because it's special. And, and it, so, it, of course, it, it turns out that the uh, coral reef was the most difficult to backwash and time consuming and everything else, and the automated systems were just fine. So, you said you also use a lot of different gateways to pull everything together, what gateways were you using? No gateways in the HMI um, except for uh, OPC gateway between the automation and the uh, and the agent and the HMI. Um, there, it was, there's back net um, for the Lutron system and then there's some um, MX, some uh, uh, back net MSTP um, Back at CCP, stuff like that. Not a ton. Really. Uh, so, yeah. okay. So, uh, building automation. This is um, kind of the backbone of everything, right? They, uh, when I talk about uh, the freshwater systems, saltwater systems, this is just stuff dedicated to the area. The systems that handle everything else are in an underground. Um, mechanical room uh, at the back of the California Academy of Sciences. It's actually another back driveway. Um, and uh, there's some hidden cooling towers back there also. And uh, so those systems serve the rest of the California the rest of the Academy and the aquarium itself and um, as a shared system, which is, is really a challenge. I mean, it, it basically means that every component of the uh, building management system is also a component of the life support system, and so it has to be treated the same way. <coughs> the, in here, so in here are, are uh, boilers, chillers, um, distribution pumps, and then um, cooling towers, and so we'll get in, into it here. 
Uh, this is a chiller plant. Uh, here's our, our operator interface diagram. So we had three, um, I think, as I recall, there were 270 tons, there's 269 tons, something like that. There's the McQuaid chillers. And uh, there's a little picture right there. Um, based on how they were set up, there's another one of these funny architecture engineering things where the plant itself was set up as a variable flow rate system here. Um, but at all the air handling units seemed like they were designed by somebody else, but they were set up as constant volume with three-way valves, if that makes sense to everybody. Uh, yeah, no, it was kind of funny. So, so you know, it, it took a lot of commissioning to get everything to, to work right, and, you know, there, there were, you'd have, like, like, circuit setter valves downstream of VFDs, like right downstream. And what, why would you do that? I don't know. We hire them not sure. Uh, anyways, so then we also added uh, a couple other chillers while I was there. One of them was a 90 ton that was dedicated for the um, for a smaller tank for the aquarium. So we set that one up to go extra cold. And um, although I, I wanted to put in glycol and then got back from aquarium management, no glycol, glycol can kill fish if it drops in the tanks, so we had to do our best with, with straight water. Uh, and then uh, another 60 ton, that was also a, a early on project that was for an exhibit space. Um, we had an exhibit coming in from the New York um, Museum of Natural History that had very rigid uh, environmental requirements, like plus or minus one degree, plus or minus like two degrees, or two uh, percent humidity. And our, the system that we had had no humidification, no dehumidification. Uh, in fact, the coils were the, the wrong direction. They were, were uh, heating and cooling rather than cooling and heating. Um, so we get to, uh, in an emergency, uh, in the middle of winter, have this 60 ton chiller shipped out from you know, the Midwest and uh, tore apart the building to get it into this, this mechanical room in the basement. Uh, tore apart the, the air handling unit on the second floor in order to uh, install double core uh, cooling coils for chill water dehumidification and then uh, another reheat coil and then automate it and uh, commission it as the uh, specimens were starting to arrive. That was really fun. Um, questions about chilling? So, do you, do you treat the water though? Like, 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 like the chill water? Yeah, the chill water chemical treatment. Just use yeah. standard water treatment. Yeah. So, it's a fish friendly. Thing. You're up. <laughs> what was the contingency for power loss? Uh, you know, there's there's two backup generators. There, there's a 1.5 megawatt backup gen and then a, a half a megawatt backup gen. Um, the half a megawatt one is actually mostly dedicated to the fire life safety system. There's a big pump in there, and I think you guys are familiar with, with fire codes, but you have to size the breaker, or something. you have to size the generator loading for the lock rotor um, current of the actual fire pump, which ends up being this like enormous number. It's like 300 kilowatts or something crazy like that. Um, so we had this giant generator, but we couldn't really load it up. Is that automated or is that automated? Um, yeah, there's actually some really interesting um, fire life safety stuff in the building. I don't have any slides on it in here, uh, but there is a uh, a vaporized water system for the um, for the collections because the co collections are basically rooms and rooms and rooms full of shells of alcohol, of nearly pure ethyl alcohol, right? So, so a huge flammable issue. So, um, there's a, a European vaporized water system in there that did go off several times, and it, it, it turns those rooms into a cloud in minutes. Uh, boiler plant, just some couple of notes here. Hey, can I, from the people managing this, can I get a, a, a stop time so I can... You get five minutes. Five minutes? All right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, boiler plant, this is really interesting. This is what I wanted to kind of share some talk about. 
the chiller plants, right, there, there's maybe like five chiller companies, something like that, right? There's like a thousand boiler companies, okay? And they're all different, and, and they, they all have their own special way that they control their boilers, and so these things were up and running and, and uh, ran into some early commissioning issues, kind of got through those, and then as I was working there, Every couple months, one of the, the stationary engineers on night duty would say, oh, the boilers are going crazy. The boilers are going crazy again last night. I mean, look in the morning, they're fine, right? The boilers are going crazy. So, so finally, I kind of took a break, and I, I went down there and looked at them, and I did some research on them. And they, they actually have a full, uh, analog 40 to 20 milliamp uh, control to them to control their, their loading, right? Um, and then they also have an enable into them. But to actually turn them off, you actually have to bring the 4 to 20 milliamp down to zero to actually have them turn off. Well, the, this building apogee system, the Siemens system, can't output zero milliamps on their analog output. So I, I ended up um, putting in a bunch of little relays in here to, dis, to completely disconnect the analog signal so that, that they could actually unload in when they were in the uh, off duty basically uh, it, yeah it, it was the darndest thing it was and then the symbol for that on the diagrams which I finally dug them got them from the manufacturer or from a vendor of theirs was a dotted line um, on the analog and that was that was it no no anyway so okay. boilers are interesting spend lots of time on them they're all weird and yeah, that's about it. Dealing with the loading was crazy. Uh, so hybrid cooling towers, also kind of interesting. So they're hybrid, meaning that there is a uh, closed loop section, sort of like a big water radiator, or the water radiator, and then there's open loop, or open system, just like a conventional cooling tower, and then they could switch between the modes uh, with the intention of, of saving water and also to reduce plume. So you basically pre-cool the water when you're running the, them in both modes. Uh, you pre-cool the condensate water, or the, sorry, the uh, condenser water uh, with the closed loop system, and then it'll go through the, the open system so you, you don't get a big cloud. Uh, we also, uh, while we were there, we put in uh, distributed power monitoring so we could get a good idea of what we were actually looking at, and um, and this kind of gives you a sense maybe of what we're looking at. So this was what we were measuring in colors here. Um, this is our solar array there, just as, as a, so it's positive, of course. Um, and then this was sort of un, uh, unmeasured. So that, that was definitely not complete, but it definitely gave us a better idea of what we were looking at. We did all the offices here, all the air handling systems, um, then the uh, aquarium. And the, and the central plants. Uh, this is just a little list of some of the changes in base design that we did while, while I was managing the system. Um, it was a lot. You know, you build a building and they, they do the best they can with the budget they have. I mean, it was completed on time and under budget, but that means that they did a lot of value engineering. So I, I was the devalue engineer, I, I guess. It's, I, I also call it architectural recovery. Um, yeah, so anyways, it's interesting, uh, and then a lot of security system stuff. Uh, the California Academy of Sciences does have a laser security system at the entrance. We're watching you. Um, and I, I've got some more slides just on, on some funner projects so we can wrap up here. Uh, so the system has a, an automated uh, natural ventilation system which includes um, all these little windows here motorized louvers here, um, little little louvers at the top. I mean, there's, there's motors all over the place. And so th then this is a project that I did to install mechanical ventilation at the, uh, above the rainforest dome. Remember all that, that those lights up there? Well, when, when you close these, these uh, windows here to irrigate the roof, all that heat just goes straight into concrete. And it's uh, it was a real problem. So. Um, we, we designed some custom ventilators and so on. This is my electrical team, or, or half of it, when I was there. Uh, and then we also did some fun things. Uh, shade 
sunshade tracking control built natively in uh, Siemens Apogee, so to control the shades on the outside of the building, and uh, some other fun things I'm running out of time here. Uh, so the, the wave machine for the, for the California coast tank broke within six months of uh, starting um, while the tank was full of fish. And the, uh, the manufacturer said, okay, how soon can you drain the tank? And, and the, the manager of the, the aquarium said, well, it means we have to kill all the fish. So um, I, got to, uh, I got to design a, a new compeller and a method to uh, remove the old one and install the new one while the tank was, uh, was full. Um, so these are uh, the steel workers, iron workers, and then there's hard hat divers down below um, installing this, this uh, new <coughs> power. So that's a great place to end. So let me let me first thank our let you guys ask a few questions. Um, he is the lead for Flex Lab. So when we saw the kinds of things that he did in, in San Francisco, we thought he would be perfect for our research facility. And you can see he's a very practical, hands-on guy. He's also going to be, if you're interested in one of those internship uh, summer programs, we're now designating him here on the spot. He knows about this. <laughs> <laughs> As your contact, so you can talk to him about things you can do in Flex Up and things you might do to develop projects there. So very hands-on, um, but can also support all the theory. So let me now let you guys ask. A Let's take two or three questions and then we're going to move on. Right. Sure. You said there was a penguin exhibit? Yeah. Um, penguin exhibit is the question. Oh, I think I was like a shed aquarium and I saw it, um, a strategy or uh, they were trying to resolve one of the penguin um, well, they weren't having sex. Right? Mm -hmm. So what they did is they grabbed all the information from the pulp and and then they imported it to the building automation system. So they were able to get the water temperature and the light temperature. Is the, that, that was done at the California Academy of Sciences. The, uh, so there was um, monthly temperature changes to the water and to the air, um, handled by two different systems, right? Because the water is in the life support system, and uh, the air is in the building automation system. And then there's also seasonal changes to the lighting inside the exhibit to reflect, um, you know, lower sun angles, higher sun angles. They're now claiming we can make sex better with this work. Well, they have to see. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Any other questions? Or at all? Yeah. 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 What isn't being integrated, so forth. Um, sure. Um, so the in integration is is probably the hardest part of, of automation in general, right? I mean, getting this thing to talk to this thing is, is difficult, right? You have to have third party hardware. Um, getting this. It, a lot of the integration here is only where we absolutely had to do it, is, is what I'm going to say. Um, this was done sort of fundamentally um, through another set of gateways. So the, the Lutron system here actually had two full sets of gateways for, for every processor. There were six lighting control processors in there. Um, so six to go to BACnet and six to go to DMS, right, on every controller or, or, or um, total. Uh, these were here basically to deal with shades and, and lighting. Uh, the building automation, this little integration, I did this just, just point by point, um, was just so that we could irrigate the roof and have the windows closed, right? Because the, the first thing that happens is we turn on the irrigation and the, and the building still wants the, the windows open for natural ventilation, right? Because they're, they're they were talking. So um, I had to, uh, to put another third party little system in there, a little PLC, uh, to get them to put a delay on the wind closing the window signal, or sorry, a delay on uh, 
the, the irrigation signal to allow the windows to close. Basically. Nice question. All right, yes. I guess I'm, I'm kind of confused by the fire alarm system itself. Sure. How do you do smoke control without integrating with the fully automation fire? Uh, all the smoke control. So in in the this in the this building, the smoke it was all single zone. Um, there are protected corridors with smoke curtains, and they're all just triggered by the Edwards um, the EST system. Five five. Yeah, it's completely standalone by code. <clears throat> Will your slides be at the website too? Will your presentation be on the website, and we'll get we'll get copies yeah. of this. Yeah. Or yeah. Access to it? yeah. And you're welcome to reach out to me if you have any other questions or, or anything. Do you want to just tell me your email real quick? Sure. All right, my email is a harding. It's a h a r d i n g, like my name. Um, at at the now I'm thinking about my academy. <laughs> at ldl.gov. <laughs> Yes. And, and no periods or anything. What, so so <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ari.